Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. With me today, once again, is Melora Jackson, and she has brought with you Sarah. She is the chief control officer. Did I get that right? Chief programs <laughs> officer. You were programs. close. <laughs> I was close. It was like, as soon as my mouth started going, my brain stopped. <laughs> with second wind dreams. Fortunately, my listeners know I am just terrible with names. <laughs> And we are discussing dementia interpreters today, which I have been very excited to discuss. And they had to postpone a week, so my excitement is even higher. So thanks for joining me, ladies. So tell us about this program. I know with my mom, she spoke in full sentences and actual English words, but there was no context. So it sounded like proper language, if that's the right term. But you had no idea what she was talking about. It was frustrating for everybody. And as everybody knows, if I made the scrunchy, what the hell are you talking about face, trying to determine what she was telling me, it made her very angry. So I obviously needed dementia interpreters way back. So tell us all about it. Of course. So dementia interpreters was created by Glenn Knight at Training to Care in the United Kingdom. And the premise of dementia interpreters is looking at barriers to communication. So at the foundation of care being provided and any interaction we have with each other, especially and especially those that are living with dementia, the crux is communication. And this training gets at that a majority of the communication is not necessarily always oral or speech communication. And we run into a lot of those barriers um, involving care for persons living with dementia. So what the training does is looks at, you know, first acknowledging that there are barriers and looking at what those barriers might be. And then once we see those and acknowledge those, how do we work past them? Because the ultimate goal of a dementia interpreter and what our responsibility is, is to ensure successful communication. And that's on our end as the care partner, the care provider, or just the person interacting. Um, that's on us. So this takes an experiential training where we put you in scenarios where you experience a barrier to communication and you are communicating with a care partner in a situation and you feel the the emotions and the feelings and the anger and the frustration of what it's like to have that barrier. So then when you interact with someone with that barrier, you can remember what that feeling is like so that you approach it in a slightly different manner so you can have successful communication. I can see why that would have been very beneficial training to have with my mom. I definitely think it's something most of us should have at some point Mm -hmm. because people just, they don't understand and they don't, mean to interact, uh, I don't want to say inappropriately because that doesn't sound right, but they they try, they try speak louder because the person's not understanding them, which that doesn't help, or those type of things. It's like, and it, it makes the care partner's job even harder. And, you know, for example, I just read um, a post on Instagram about a gal, her, her husband's got super early onset Alzheimer's, And it took her and I think a sister or sister-in-law to get him to the neurologist. The neurologist never even looked at him, didn't talk to him, didn't acknowledge him. And she's just beside herself with anger, which I totally understand. But that is such a common problem. Or in my case, I would take my mom to the doctor and they would talk to her and ask questions of her and treat me like I was just the driver, like literally. Because I would let them interact with her because that was the appropriate way to handle it. But whatever she answered incorrectly, and it was information that they needed to have correct, I would basically comment slightly under my breath so they could hear me, but maybe mom didn't acknowledge it. And they never acknowledged me. And it was like, I'm not the Uber driver just sitting over here playing on my phone. So we definitely need this training that all of us are going to need as we go forward, whether we have a loved one with any form of dementia or not. So where do you guys, how do you roll out this training? So right now we do our training virtually, uh, mostly virtually. Uh, That way we can work with anyone across the country that's interested in doing so. The one requirement is if you're interested in the training, you have to be part of 
there has to be several of you together so you can do those inner that communication interaction because communication is between you and another person. So you kind of need that other person there to do the communication. But uh, for example, I just recently trained a group of six nurses out of Maryland. So they were all, they were able to all be together and in little groups while uh, Laura and I did the training from our respective locations. So we could do it with anyone across the country. Um, and we set it up for a time that works best for others. And, you know, we get the names of people involved and their uh, kind of their roles prior to so we can tailor the training a little bit towards scenarios that they would encounter um, so that they can put it within context of their day to day, uh, either job or their caregiving situation. So if a caregiver is interested in this training, they're going to have to reach out to some other caregivers, care partners and and form a small group, <laughs> at least yeah. four of you. I mean, yeah, obviously, so we can do it in groups as small as two, like a pair, um, to do that as well, or groups up to like the last one we did. We had six people there. We ended up pairing them off to small groups, and we could do up to nine people together at one time. Well, two to nine is not an impossible number to. I mean, if you can't find one other person that would like to do this, then we're in trouble. So. <laughs> What are some of the scenarios like you had with the nurses you, that you talked about and helped so, them work through? Mm -hmm. So there's our, there's prescribed exercises that we do, which we'll have to take the training to um, experience those. But when we talk with them, being able to provide specific scenarios, one really, um, I don't want to say popular, but common um, experience that I have seen and used in training is around the context of we all have a different vernacular. We say different things for the same word. So for example, the example we use is toilet. You can call it a lot of different things and they all mean the exact same things. Well, this in this scenario, in this example, there was what was being described as behaviors and difficulties with a nursing home resident because they kept asking where the head was. And so <laughs> they kept having continence, um, incontinence and having what they were describing as behaviors around, you know, not using the actual toilet or facility or whatever you want to call it. And it took another like family member of another resident who came in to said, oh, to realize head means Toilet means bathroom for those people that were like in the Navy. And so the moment they understood that communication, all these quote unquote behaviors, they, they were gone. There were no more issues because they were able to understand that communication and meet that person where they were at. That makes sense. That's a funny story because I knew exactly what it meant. I don't know why. My dad was a Marine way before I was born and... I don't know. I guess it surprises me they didn't know that, but at least somebody could help them out. Yes. And it's one of those things that also points out just in general, how many different like ways of saying things just across the country um, that we run into and being able to recognize our own use of our own language um, and reaffirms that we need to meet that person where they're at. And that means understanding their history and their background. Where did they grow up? What was their, you know, what did they do as a career? Those types of things. So you can put the communication within their context rather than within your own context. I would also think it would be helpful to know if they are currently living in a region of the United States that isn't their home region. Yeah. Just my husband is from New York originally, and they traveled across the country via the Southern route, I'm trying to remember which freeway, but that's not going to come to me. And his dad and some waitress in a, you know, greasy spoon diner, one of those delicious places for breakfast, got into an argument over pancakes versus flapjacks versus I think griddle cakes. I'm not sure what, I know there's another word, but it's like, it's pancakes around here, but you know, I'm familiar with flapjacks, but if I had dementia, I might get confused if you're talking about flapjacks and I'm talking about pancakes. Yes, very much so. I mean, that happens just like in every day with people we interact. Um, I, Second Wind Dreams were located in a suburb of Atlanta, Georgia. That's where I live right now. I am not from here. I am from the Midwest. Um, and the term y'all is very foreign or used to be very foreign to me until I moved down here. And I got a stern lecture when I said you guys rather than y'all. So like we do this throughout our, our entire lives and I'm able to adjust my communication down here when I interact with people from the South and say y'all. Um, but 
you know, if I had, you know, dementia was living with dementia or having some different difficulties with memory, like that's really a hard concept to grasp. And I would need someone to meet me where I was at and understand that it's okay if I say you guys and I'm in Georgia. Um, so, you know, having that understanding is just really crucial. Okay. So curious minds want to know what's the problem with saying you guys, besides, <laughs> besides that it's gendered and we know that, okay, we're not supposed to do those things anymore. Now, so so the, I can only like provide this, my lecture that I was given, I was doing it, it was shortly after I moved to Georgia and I was giving this like really big training to hundreds of people. And I was trying to get their attention because they were doing like an activity this was several years ago. And I kept saying, you guys, you guys, and no one was paying attention to me. Uh, so I was, and I finally got their attention and I was a little frazzled and I sat down um, while they were working on another exercise. And the gal I'd been working with to set up this training, like slides into the chair next to me. And she just looks me dead in the eye and goes, you're not from here. And I'm like panicking. I was like, no, uh, no I'm not. And she was like, don't ever say that again. And I was like, say what? And she goes, you, she said, no one will respect you down here. If you say you guys, it's y'all or nothing. I was like, okay. And from there on out, I had, when I was doing these trainings around the state of Georgia, I had to say y'all. And it was like, kind of like, you know, in a way just ingrained in my head that if I'm deal, doing a training in Georgia, you say y'all, because otherwise they're not going to have the respect. For you. That is really interesting. I know people that are here in Northern California that say y'all, and it's like, you aren't from Texas. What, what is, what is up with that? You know? So it, I'm now I'm wondering if they've experienced something similar to you and now it's just easier. And I don't know. It's, I'm curious now. Very much <laughs> so, so, what, yeah. so what other kind of scenarios have you helped people work through? Cause that was super fascinating. And so, it just goes to show you that English is not an easy language to master. Oh, not at all. I um, had a lovely interaction and training with some home health aides uh, based out of Texas. And so they have a lot of Spanish speaking um, and actually a huge Vietnamese population as well. And one of the things that they were continuously running into is that while the person they were providing care for spoke English, the further along they got, um, they'd revert back to their their original language. And so that was something they learned very quickly that any care provider that they had, had to be able to speak both languages because what they were running into is then you would kind of get, you know, a version of like Spanglish where they're talking a little bit in Spanish and a little bit of English within one sentence. So you had to have someone who could follow that. Um, and that was, that was very enlightening to think about those that English is a second language is they're going to a majority of the time to revert back to their original language and taking that into consideration that that may, that is going to provide a better communication. So if we understand that from the get go and ask questions like, do they know another language? What is their you know home language and prepare from that from the beginning? It makes that communication that much easier. That makes sense. I wonder if the earlier in life they learn a second language, if they then lose the knowledge of that second language later. Does that make sense? So like if you learn English as a child versus a teenager versus an adult, do they hang on to that longer? I don't know. Do you know that answer? Cause I think I that's really interesting. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually. Yeah. So I, um, you may have heard of um, rice. Carl Riceberg did some work um, a long time ago with dementia. And one of the, the theories that he had that's proved true is that um, when people have dementia, they move backwards in time. So if you learn um, a language, you know, say when you're a child, a young child, you're going to retain that longer, uh, a second language. That is, um, if you then if you learn it as a teenager or a young adult, you're more likely to lose it. So, yeah. So people who um, like in the situation that uh, Sarah's talking about probably learned English as a second language as young adults or, or in their late teens. And so therefore they lost it. But had they learned it as tots they probably would be able to still speak English fluently. So it does happen. That's part of dementia and very, very normal. Um, you know, so it's, it's all about meeting them where they're at with, with um, that communication, whatever, whether it's verbal or nonverbal, really. So, yeah. One more reason that I should have learned Spanish back in high school. You yeah. Know, everybody took <laughs> Spanish. 
So I thought I'd be smart and do something different. And I took French. And then there was nobody to speak French to. So now I have not even a rudimentary grasp of French. <laughs> and we had a, a French student stay with us for a month several years ago. And I was hoping that I could bring some of my French back. But his English was so good. And part of being here was to improve his English, which barely needed it. I was like, I am not torturing this poor young man with my horrible French. <laughs> and it was it was interesting because um, he was calling it a baseball match. And we're taught, you know, not to correct people because that's rude. But that was what we were supposed to do. And I'm like, game. It's called a baseball game. <laughs> so it was just very interesting. And he learned it, I think, you know, seven, eight is when he started taking English. So that's that's a fascinating I mean that's why I assumed that the if you learned it earlier you would lose it later which sounds strange but it makes sense <laughs> so one of the people that lived with my mom in the memory residence she was Irish so she did speak um Celtic Gaelic Gaelic is Scottish I'm losing my heritage here but she mostly mumbled and occasionally you could get an, a word or two that wasn't mumble or Celtic. And I just had to like nod and, and just kind of look at body language. Although there was one time I posed a question to my mom. I was, it, I didn't expect my mom to answer. It was a, you know, I was, we were planting seedlings and I was trying to multiply and I just out loud said, well, oh, five times six is, what is that again? And this gal, clear as a bell you would have thought she was one of the workers said 30 and i was like i've never heard a word that clear out of her mouth before it was just it was so fascinating because never heard a clear word out of her again so how do we deal with people who have lost the the physical ability to communicate well is that something you guys work with yes and um, one of the things we teach in in the dementia interpreters course actually is body language that you just mentioned. Like that's a huge thing. Um, a lot of our communication is nonverbal. We just default to verbal. So this is reiterating and looking at body language too. Cause we, we all tend to have similar styles around body language. Like if you're in pain, everyone tends to have the grimace. Um, a lot of people, if you act, ask them to act out pain, grab their stomach, by the way, in case you want to know. By default, everyone just like, yeah, grabs their stomach. Um, but so looking at that body language and teaching that when you're approaching someone, um, just in general, but especially in the context of dementia, is looking at that body language. And so while you're communicating with them and if you're speaking with them, is watching their body language and how they react, because that's going to tell you a lot um, within there. So we do talk about that. Um, one of the exercises and things we talk about is brainstorming what are other ways to communicate if you lost the ability to speak. Um, a lot of the times people come up with writing, texting, typing, if that's what they know, um, like picture boards, uh, anything that they can point or gesture to that has images on there so they're not having to default to remembering like what a word is, um, because sometimes that can be a challenge for a person living with dementia is remembering specifically what that word is. But if they're given an image that helps in some cases overcome that barrier. Yeah, like calling a watch a hand clock or the couch, mm -hmm. the sitter honor, a couple of examples I've heard recently. <laughs> Which, sitter honor, that's a new one, but yes, yeah. And it makes, per I mean, couch doesn't really make sense. Sitter honor makes sense. Uh -huh. <laughs> it sounds funny, but y'all want to sit around or my, or you want to come over and sit around or my, I can't even do it right. <laughs> <laughs> come on over. We'll just have us have a chat on the sitter honor. There we go. Now I got it. <laughs> it's um, with my mom, her visual processing was r just really, really bad. So I don't think like a, I'm, envisioning kind of a picture board that you could have them point at what they're trying to tell you. But I don't think that would have worked for my mom. It, she really from a distance other than at the very last year, year and a half of her life, she, you know, started combing her hair way different. You know, she looked, I don't want to say she looked, she wasn't unkempt, but she didn't look like her so much, you know, with no makeup, hair comb different, just, you know, you know how we all get at the end. It's just not always pretty. 
But from a distance, if you heard her, you would assume that what she said made sense to me, who was sitting there talking to her, when it really didn't. And like I said, it was all straight up <clears throat> actual English words, no mumble, and it sounded like a sentence, but I don't know. I never could figure out what she was trying to tell me. It was so frustrating. Is that a place where maybe I should have looked at body language or, I mean, half the time, most of the time, she'd be sitting and just, you know, shooting the breeze. So it was, I'm not sure there was a lot of body language to interpret, which is why it was so hard to do. <laughs> it's why I tried really hard to figure out what she was telling me. Yeah, I think in addition to um, non I mean, even if a person doesn't move a lot, um, I think focusing on um, what their emotion is and what they're feeling, that uh, gives you a lot of clues right there, too. So if you know that, you know, even if what she's saying is really a word salad, doesn't make any sense at all, you could tell if she was happy, content, distressed or whatever. And so you knew kind of how to respond, at least in general, to what she was saying, even if you didn't know exactly what she was telling you. So sometimes you have to look at, at those at that level of, of you know, just focusing on what they're they're projecting in terms of emotions um, and then other nonverbal cues, even if they can't move much. So that's one of the things that um, in this training that we address as well is what, what if you can't move at your um, arms or whatever, you can't be expressive with your hands anymore, then what do you do? So that's the next level of this this training that that Sarah takes people through. So. I can, I, so thinking back to one of the last quote conversations, that's air quotes for the audio audience here with my mom. First off, she started off with telling me her, her brothers were normal people now. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, and I had a second to kind of joke with her about that because I wanted to know how she knew they were normal. Cause I didn't think they were normal. And we were basically just having your typical social type conversation and then it reverted into the word salad. And I was, I guess I was in a mental place to understand that we were just shooting the breeze. So it didn't really matter what I was saying, what she was saying, as long as I kept that feeling going. So what you said was very beneficial. It just took me forever to learn that, unfortunately. Because I always wanted to be a respectful daughter and respond to her appropriately as in respond if she said x then i responded to x not some random lover here whatever because she would get really frustrated really easily and then the visit would go south quickly and none of us wanted that that was not my goal with her so kind of assessing the the mood of the room is is definitely something we should do because they they seem to interpret body language and mood much better than we do. I don't know why we revert to language all the time. That's, that's kind of a, it's, it's, um, doesn't always serve us very well. It kind of, it, going off of what you said and what Melora said too, is that a lot of the times what can be experienced is that when you're working and providing care and interacting with that person living with dementia, they may not remember what you said, but they remember that feeling that you gave them. So continuing on, you know, that positive, you know, just kind of shooting the breeze type conversation, she's going to remember that feel good, kind of just easygoing mood. Um, and not necessarily what you're talking about, especially if there's word salad involved, but that mood she's going to remember and enjoy. And so making sure that's there, even if the words, don't always, I don't want to say don't match, but if you don't know the right words to say, that sometimes just setting that mood and giving that lasting emotion is of more value than the words you're going to say. And I did experience that with my mom. I've told the story how we always went out to the park or the pool or wherever to watch kids because that helped my sanity. She enjoyed it. We got outside in the fresh air and the sunshine, which is definitely beneficial to all of us. And one day I was, uh, my husband and I flew home from a conference. I'm sure you guys are well aware that going through Denver is a guaranteed layover, whether you wanted it or not. And we got in late and I had learned <laughs> the hard way, unfortunately, that if I was tired or a little stressed or I was allowing my to-do list to run like a ticker tape through my brain, she would pick up on it and we would have a negative visit. So being smart for once, I 
went with a really delicious treat and my wedding album because it happened to be my anniversary that day. And we just, I was like, we'll just sit in the courtyard and we'll visit. She can look at these wedding pictures. I already know she's not going to know anybody in there. Totally fine. I just wanted to give her something nice to do that didn't involve me getting her in and out and from here to there because that wasn't always easy. And when I showed up, she goes, oh, hi, where are we going today? And I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, of all days to ask me that, this is the wrong one. And you remember we go out all the time? It was just shocking that she, that's how she re referred to me, or, you know, how she thought of me, is I was the fun friend that took her out places. I mean, it was a nice feeling, but it was a little less nice since we weren't going out that day. But she did have a nice visit, and I was just blown away because... We'd been going out for like a year and a half, almost two years. And that was the only time she ever said that to me. So, of course, it was the day we didn't go out. <laughs> but, you know, she told everybody, oh, I was her best friend. And so that's, I tried to act like a friend would act, which it worked, but it was always a little challenging. So what other kind of scenarios are, are should we be thinking about or like you can help people with? Because now I'm sure we've got them interested in doing the training, but. Let's oh, yeah. Maybe. So actually, um. Kind of going off the scenarios, one thing I also want to uh, quickly talk about um, or talk a little bit more about is part of what goes along with the dementia interpreters training that is outside of the training that is a standalone for anyone is actually the dementia dictionary. So mm. it's set up um, as a collection of behaviors, emotions, feelings, scenarios uh, that a a caregiver, a loved one, a friend, a family, someone is experiencing that they're unable to interpret, that they need some help understanding what's going on. So they can go to this website. Um, you can first, you can go ahead and search the website and see if anyone else has had the same scenario, what interpretation has been for it. And if you can't find it, you can submit your own. Um, and then everyone who's gone through this dementia interpreters training uh, is able to then get on a forum to help provide translation for anything that's submitted worldwide. Um, and then it it's kind of like a crowdsourced answer. So it's not just depending on like professionals in the field, which are great, don't get me wrong. Laura and I are professionals and I, I'm glad we do what we do, but we don't always have the same hands-on experience that a loved one has. And I may have a very different experience with like my grandfather who has dementia versus, you know, the experience that you had with your mother. And so having day-to-day -day caregivers get in and provide this input on what the interpretation may be is this wealth of a resource and information that you're not going to get anywhere else. And so having access to this dementia dictionary, which is free to everyone to get on and search and do some research, your own personal research. And if you can't find it, submit your own you know, issue that you're looking and behavior or emotion that you need that interpretation for and get like feedback from real people who are doing this day in and day out. Oh, that sounds fantastic. See, I always learn cool things and it's been, you know, almost two years since I can't believe it's been almost two years since my mom died. It's like life is insane, but that, that would have been a go-to that I would have had bookmarked on my phone just for the scenarios that I found myself in with her. And you said that D dimension dictionary is on this website. So you're talking about second wind dreams. You no, know, if you just Google Dementia Dictionary or it's DementiaDictionary.com, you can get to the website. There's also an app for it, too. I know it's available um, for Apple products. I'm not entirely for sure it's ready for Android yet. It may have just come out on Android. Um, but so there's an app. So if you're in that specific, you know, visiting your mother type situation and you're like, I need an answer to need to look for an answer right now, you can hop on there and look. I mean, like I said, it's crowdsourced, and that's what makes this unique and a standalone thing is that it is, in fact, crowdsourced. The um, interpretations are vetted before they're published, so something um, incorrect information is not provided. Um, but for the most part, this is all crowdsourced, so you're getting answers from people in your same exact scenario rather than a professional saying, well, it's probably this. These are people saying, I have experienced this exact situation, and this is what the interpretation is. That is fantastic. Why did I not know about that? Oh, this is why I talk to all these wonderful guests and learn things and why I'm still doing this because, you know, I obviously don't need the information currently. I hope I don't need it again in the future. We've been dealing. My mom was the third generation that had 
some sort of cognitive impairment. My maternal great grandmother died before I was born, so I didn't have to deal with that one. But I've had enough <laughs> between my grandmother and my mom. I'm I'm done. But I still don't know enough stuff, so I guess I'm just going to keep on learning because it's good for my brain. So you've given everybody a lot of really great input and ideas. So where they can go to Second Wind Dreams to to find the training once they've paired up with some folks that are also interested? Yes. So our website is secondwind.org and you can go um, there and find uh, additional information. A lot of the same information we just talked about, about the Dementia Interpreters Program. There's also like a little inquiry form. So if you've found your partners that you want to do this, um, you can fill out that form and it gets directed um, to myself and we'll set up a training. Um, we provide all the equipment and all the handouts to do the training um, in a setting and at a time that works best for everyone involved. Um, and then we have lots of other resources on our website as well um, for caregivers. Awesome. And you guys are also the providers of the uh, dementia tour, which Melora and I talked about before, and I have personally taken and is wonderful. So I think I'm going to let everybody in my support group know about this in case there's a bunch of them that want to sign up and learn more. Our support group used to be really big, and the longer we're on Zoom, the smaller it gets. So, it's it's we need to give it some some life support. I think. Is there anything else we should know? Any any good tidbits you guys are holding back on me? <laughs> Laura's been so quiet down there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I think just, um, and I'm sure Sarah can add to this, but um, if you do go to our website, like Sarah said, we have a variety of resources. So not only the Dementia Interpreters or the Virtual Dementia Tour, but we have a lot of resources for uh, caregivers um, on different subjects around providing care and tools for um, uh, for family members and, and the community. So um, if you can't find it on our website, you can certainly ask us and we'd be more than happy to either connect connect with another resource or um, maybe see if that's something we need to start providing too. So yeah. <laughs> always seems to be new new avenues of need. So which gives us new avenues of commerce and support and just I don't know. It's like it's been crazy. <laughs> My brain is frazzled from moving, so <laughs> uh, if there isn't any more secrets you guys want to share, the Second Wind Dreams website is linked in the show notes. And if you haven't heard their, the episode I did with Melora on the Dementia Tours, definitely catch that one also because it's super fascinating. And definitely check out their website because it's, like they said, it's got a lot of great information and help, which we all could use. So I really appreciate this this morning, ladies. I know it's a challenge to get three people together on Zoom in these days. But we made it work. <laughs> yes, we did. Thank you again to Melora and Sarah from Second Wind Dreams. And I will be back again next Tuesday. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.